Okay, thank you very much. I'm Lorenzo Sabatini, University of Modern Reggio Emilia, Italy. It's my pleasure to chair this session. So I invite the first speaker, Henry Kebel, who will present a paper entitled Non-Prehensive Cooperative Object Transportation with Omnidirectional Mobile Robots, Organization, Control, Simulation, and Experimentation. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So as has been said, I'm uh, Henrik Eber from the University of Stuttgart in Germany. And actually I'm coming from a mechanics institute, recently started my postdoc work there. So before we get fully into the methodological part of the talk, I would like to uh, briefly motivate why... Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. Thank you for fixing the tech here. So now it seems to work. I hope everybody sees everything also online. So before we get fully into the methodological part of the talk, I would like to briefly motivate why we as a mechanics institute really also like to look at this area of research. And maybe at the beginning of the symposium, you're not yet fully tired of, of kind of motivational talks in that regard. And um, well, um, I guess we all uh, share the sentiment that uh, distributed and networked and cooperative robotics will be a future driver of progress in robotics. It has already revolutionized many aspects of robotics, but we all share the hope, otherwise it wouldn't be here, that cooperative robotics will contribute that in a significant way. But I guess in our work, we all have made the experience that uh, realizing the promised advantages like flexibility or increased robustness due to reconfigurations in case of a hardware failure, that that is really hard to realize because the distributed system actually has many, many complexities that a non-distributed one wouldn't have. And that can mitigate some of the advantages. And therefore, and the, the field is still very much in a state, at least in my opinion, where the research on well-defined model problems can really still contribute in a significant way to the state of the art. And coming from mechanics, we like to look at mechanically motivated model problems. So you see uh, two examples um, on the right hand side. Um, in the lower uh, video, it's not running strangely, but usually a plate would be passed from one of the robots to the others. So, um, and looking at mechanically motivated problems fits the very notion of robotics, actually, because if you think about the etymology of the word, it's actually about automating work and work usually means in the classical sense, nothing but mechanical work. Um, so uh, that's the thing. And in this talk, we will focus on the upper video. So the scenario in their cooperative object transportation. And um, therein, the goal is that robots shall self-reliantly transport arbitrarily shaped polygonal objects. In the meantime, it does also work with smooth ones. Um, and they shall do so completely self-reliantly without any centralized decision-making instance, so a fully distributed system. And um, they shall, and they shall uh, only be able to push the object. They cannot pull it. And they shall push it along a known path here, the red dashed reference path. And it includes many challenges. We want to start developing something as complicated as this of, this, of course, in simulations. So we need a proper simulator, not some physics engine like in a video game, but a proper mechanical simulator with proper mechanical models. Hence the connection to mechanics. But also I mostly trained as a control engineer, actually. So distributed control and organization are right up my alley. And uh, we all know about the challenges of software and communication. But in this video, it seems that the robots already do, do a decent job of pushing this object and of reorganizing. What are we doing methodologically? And um, in that regard, our key idea is to decompose the task into two main components uh, to be able to leverage as much as possible of recent progress in distributed control theory. And the first, uh, the first uh, part is then formation synthesis, where the idea is to synthesize or devise a formation along the edges of the object, useful to translate and rotate the object as currently necessary. And then we can use a distributed formation controller to uh, move the formation and thereby the object through the environment. Now there are many aspects in the control loop and in the interest of time in this short talk, we cannot cover many of them. So there are many cooperative aspects, even with negotiation, all of that. Uh, if you please approach me at any time, if you want more detail than is possible in this talk, I also use the opportunity to bring an additional poster along. So that would also be a good opportunity to, for further discussions. But now let's see at least which kind of scheme we employ for formation control. And what we're employing is a scheme from theoretic literature work on distributed model predictive control. And there's some work in it and modifications of the optimization problem solved therein so that there are nominal provable closed loop guarantees for nominal system only, but there are guarantees that are proven in a rigorous manner. 
And we let the robots exchange data only once every time step, and they all solve an optimization problem concurrently in each time step. And the optimization problem to be solved by each robot in every time step looks like this, with, with uh, what's marked in blue now corresponding to this theoretic construction to be able to have um, nominal guarantees. And we allow rate constraints on the control input for well-controlled behavior. And um, if you know a bit about optimal control or MPC, usually there, we would like to optimize over the whole input vector U containing the inputs of all the robots. But of course, we cannot do that here because the control inputs of the other robots are unknown at the current time because they all optimize concurrently. So what's done is the usual trick in DMPC and theoretic DMPC, we construct feasible candidate solutions based on the optimal solutions from the previous time step because there was enough time to communicate them. And if it's done in the right way, um, one can have nice theoretic properties for this kind of controller. But the remaining engineering question is how to choose the output for tracking, in our case, the output matrix C composing a linear output. And we chose it, choose it this way. There are many ways to do it. But um, the first line corresponds to the geometric formation center and the remaining lines to the robot positions relative to the formation center. It's an uncommon choice. Many use chain-like graphs instead, but this allows us to weigh differently uh, the control goals of maintaining the formation shape and of moving the whole formation, which of course fits the notion of this transportation problem that you've seen. Um, but with that, you have now a rough idea how we, can, how we do formation control, but how do we come up with these nice formation shapes? And the first idea there is to reduce the dimensionality of the task, because by, by um, appropriately parametrizing the object edge, we can reduce it to a one-dimensional deployment problem, mostly one-dimensional, along the object edges. And the idea is to formulate an optimization problem whose feasible points correspond to formations useful for transportation. But which kind of formation is useful for transportation? That's now again in the field of mechanics. And at least geometrically, the first requirement is that the translational error of the object is representable as a conic combination of the normal vectors at the contact points. And the normal movement at the same time is also needs to be serviceable to rotate the object as required by the rotational error. And as a more mundane requirement, the robots need to have a certain distance from one another so that they don't collide. And uh, we can write down the optimization problem with that. It's, from a solver perspective, a rather intricate one. But we need some quantities for that. It's rather simple to write down, actually. The number of contact points, the lever arms, and the normal vectors. And these uh, suffice to write down the requirements from above in the form of constraints in a nicely mathematical manner. And the cost function merely serves the purpose to try to prefer formations which we require to less frequently require reorganizations in case uh, the transportation errors change. And with that, we can already put that into our software architecture and do simulations, which is useful to develop it. And also already in simulations, we use the full distributed architecture uh, with communication, these arrow-like symbols to denote, denote communication. And even there for each robot, completely separate programs are running, even multiple ones for tasks on different timescales. So we have one dealing with real-time tasks, which output we can watch here, but we also have an information agent, so it's called here, which solves the optimization problem that you've just seen uh, in a distributed manner with a custom distributed algorithm to obtain formations that are useful. And that all runs uh, separately, asynchronously, only network communication. And the simulator does what a real world would do. It uh, receives control inputs, publishes measurements, and it's a proper mechanical simulator because that's what we traditionally did at a mechanics institute. But that's just uh, simulations. They are nice for developing, but how about if we replace the simulator with hardware? And this is just a small selection of the hardware experiments conducted with this uh, scheme. And I have to say all the results that you will be seeing, they had been done in a very short time frame within, within two weeks, so it worked fast. And in the upper left-hand side, you can see a robot has momentarily left the transportation. It will later rejoin. In the upper middle, the robots had to reorganize to push the object downward. In particular, we can see that robots can join and leave the network at our behest. They are not pre-programmed to do that, we just message them. And the remaining videos, you can see intricately shaped non-convex object being pushed around, at times with as many robots as we had available at the time in our lab. Uh, so it also seemed to scale well with the number of robots evolved, which kind of is the hope and expected with a distributed architecture. But with that, in this short talk, it's already time for me to conclude the presentation. And I would like to do so by just mentioning the top three lessons learned during this project. The first one is, 
uh, ideas from distributed control theory like DMPC really helped us achieve the goals. I also did a study on comparing different schemes and that really was beneficial. So uh, it's not that, that it's not an arbitrary choice actually. And then I guess we all know that or have experienced that software is a big issue. You have to tell that people from control theory um, because we have tasks on different time scales, concurrency, conflicting information, race conditions, and we need to really have a good progress from simulation to experiments using the same code base. But the most crucial aspect here for me is that all major aspects of the control loop were based on optimization. And that to me, I guess is the main reason why in all the experiments, re experiment results that you have seen and that you will see, the very same set of parameters was used. Was used. So we just put them in a new situation and they can deal with that. There's no retraining involved or anything. And that's to me what robotic automation is about. It should work automatically in different scenarios. So what's next for us? Well, we would like to study the cooperation of robots with more, more severe non ergonomic constraints. The ones you've seen were omnidirectional. Thankfully, work on that has progressed nicely with, with my younger colleague, um, who will give the subsequent talk. So that's also a motivation to listen to that talk. And we want to move toward a force level control formulation. Currently, it's mostly based on kinematic descriptions. And uh, we would like to study the cooperation of robots with different physical capabilities. Also, that's interesting from a mechanical perspective. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your kind attention. And I would like to do so with these additional results that once more highlight the versatility of the scheme. I would be delighted for some discussions now or whenever you, whenever you feel during the symposium. Thank you. Questions? So I, was, I would like to start with a question, with a short question. So, um, how much uncertainties can your uh, method deal with? I mean, like uncertain friction coefficients and the shape of no knowledge of the shape of the object or uh, things like this. Okay, that's an, of course a very important question. So uh, so far we didn't yet do a um, formal investigation of uncertainties, but rather simulations were. Uh, I mean, in simulation you could do it. But um, actually, the hardware experiments that you see are there in, no, in no way perfect. So I, I said that the, all the experiment videos you've seen have been done within the same two weeks, and that even involved constructing these objects, gluing them together from from boxes, so to say. So um, in in that sense, there's a lot of friction going on. It was uh, during winter times when there was stones from 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 snow prevent uh, from and from removing snow on the experiment scene. So you can see the object sometimes getting stuck, um, and then um, they continue to push them. So there are a lot of uncertainties involved. We didn't do a formal analysis, but at least in the experiments, they were in no way perfect. So it seemed fine, but the object shape was known pretty exactly. I mean, measured by hand, but that's something that was given to them. So in that regard, uh, yeah, they need a good object shape. Thank you. Other questions? Hi, um, the question I have is, do you have uh, an insight towards the number of agents that starts to become redu redundant according to the shape that you're trying to move? Um, is there any level of uh, optimality where it becomes too many agents and it doesn't do you any benefit or anything? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. That's also a very insightful question. Uh, so there is actually theory on that. Maybe later on there's a talk on that. I, I'm not sure the title sounds like it. Um, it, of course, depends on what kind of object shape you have. You can see that, for instance, the upper middle video, one of the robots has two contact points. So it rather also depends on the number of contact points, how many robots are sufficient. Um, I mean, as soon as you can cage it, um, um, it's obviously enough. Um, in many cases, with free robots, you at least can push it in a direction. If there's a lot of sliding involved, you might also need some something on the other side to break them down. With six robots, you can definitely do it by for each degree of for each degree of freedom and breaking it down. You, you can purpose one robot for that. Um, but also the question is what is redundant in that sense? Um, because together they have more pushing force. You could incorporate that in the formation synthesis optimization problem. We didn't do that yet. We are currently doing that uh, as soon as we can measure forces. Um, and actually the schemes, the cooperation schemes, since the fully connected graph, we could separate it into multiple ones. I did that in earlier work, but uh, for that number of robots fully connected is, is fine. It's not that bad if messages don't arrive, but um, it actually, they get more conservative with more agents. So there is a sweet spot actually with um, how fast they will be moving 
and the number of robots involved. So if you don't need much pushing force, it's enough to use as many robots as strictly necessary for the case that will mostly be the optimal one if the object is light enough. I think in the interest of time, we need to stop here. So let's uh, thank the speaker one more time. Okay, so can I ask the second speaker to come here? Second speaker will be Mario Rosenfelder, who will uh, present the work entitled the Cooperative Distributed Model Predictive Formation Control of non holonomic Robotic Agents. Yeah, so thank you very much. Um, I'm Mario Rosenfelder, also from the same institute as Henrik Abel, and that's also why, um, or what explain why we have a mechanical background, also, uh, as you can also see in a second. So I would like to proceed not only with this traditional slide design, but also with the topic of cooperative formation control. In particular, I'm going to talk about cooperative distributed MPC applied to formations of non holonomic mobile robots. So why is this an interesting um, topic? Let me briefly motivate it by two main blocks. The first block is distributed formation control, um, which cooperatively solves a common task, as you have seen before, a transportation task, or if you want to example, um, sense the environment with a high accuracy. One possible advantage is that, um, for example, if one robot breaks down, for a transportation task, the task maybe is still achievable. To put it into practice, and um, what you have seen, one possibility is cooperative DMPC, which utilizes all benefits of optimization-based approaches. As you can see here, for example, for the formation control of the omnidirectional robots you have seen before as well. The second block which motivates our investigations are the so-called non-holonomic mobile robots. In particular, we're gonna focus during the first minutes on the differentially driven mobile robots, which are really popular um, in many application fields. Why are they popular? So it's, in my opinion, mostly because of their simple design, which renders them really cost efficient. Um, yeah, and I think all of you know them. We have seen many applications also um, in the talk before, if you have a vacuum cleaner at home. What's one drawback of the simple design? So the main drawback, in my opinion, is that the simple design um, yields a very challenging control task due to a non holonomic constraint, which we also see in the following. However, there are of course exist approaches in order to control these kind of robots, for example, nonlinear MPC approach. And the goal of our work now is to bridge the gap and to combine these two approaches in order to obtain a controller, which is capable of really precisely controlling formations of non holonomic mobile robots. So let's start by having a closer look on the differential drive robot. This robot is usually described by its pose in the plane, as well as its two input, the translational and rotational speed of the robot. We then obtain a driftless nonlinear system, which is subject to the before mentioned non holonomic constraint, which hinders the robot from moving sideways. As I said, one approach to control um, these kind of robots is an unconstrained MPC approach, where we seek to minimize a positive definite stage cost function along the prediction horizon. Um, what's crucial here is that we do not have any terminal constraints. Usually in MPC, uh, MPC this stage cost is chosen to be a quadratic function which penalizes the deviation to the origin. However, it has been shown that for the setting with the differential drive forward, this does not necessarily yield asymptotic stability. A few years ago, then a group led by Carl Wattman introduced a quite unusual non quadratic cost function, which indeed renders the closed loop origin asymptotically stable. So let's move on and have a closer look at the stage cost. So in particular, I would like to compare it to a standard quadratic cost as given here uh, with the dash dotted orange line. And in blue, you can see this tailored non quadratic stage cost. So what's the main point of the stage cost and also of the um, future minute of this task. So the key characteristic is that we have close to the origin here in the center of the picture, the level sets are getting more elongated in the X direction, which is actually a well controllable direction. So this stage cost enables us to reverse further in order to approach the origin in a way where we consider the non holonomic constraints and thus we do not obtain any remaining deviation. However, we do not only, uh, only want to drive to the origin, but also to any set point in a plane. And that's 
why we are as mechanics introduce a coordinate transformation. In particular, we rotate the level sets um, around the set axis by the angle of the desired orientation as depicted here um, with the blue color. So by then substituting this into our control framework, namely the stage cost, we obtain the following modified and tailored stage cost for the MPC controller, where we uh, penalize the deviation in this reference frame. So illustratively what happens, we rotate these level sets and thus can approach the origin or the desired set point without any remaining deviation. So far um, uh, inside onto or into the control of a single differential drive forward. Let's have a look at a formation consisting of non-holonomic mobile robots or differential drive forward. So we describe, as we also have seen before, for the other kind of robots, the formation by means of a virtual leader, uh, in particular the geometric center, and the relative position of each robot with respect to this leader. Mathematically, we concatenate all states and inputs and obtain the following decoupled dynamics. However, since we are in cooperative robotics, we do not want to control the robots individually, but rather um, cooperatively, and thus we introduce an auxiliary output to describe the formation. This auxiliary output consists, so first, of the virtual leader, as I said, second, of the relative position of each robot with respect to this leader, and what's in addition to the omnidirectional robot, we also have to include the orientation in order to respect the non holonomic constraint. And it's also crucial that, again, we describe these variables here in the reference frame. So as you have seen also before, it's of utmost importance to choose the stage cost based on our uh, theoretical findings in order to bear in mind the non holonomic constraints. So what we do is we use a stage cost made up of three components. The first component penalizes the deviation of the virtual leader. Analogously, um, the same applies for the relative position of each robot. And third, we penalize the control effort of each robot. So to one small point out, it's important that we have here um, this non quadratic stage cost in order to enable the formation as a whole, but also each robot individually to approach the set point along a well controllable direction such that we can pre uh, precisely control the formation. Since we use a predictive approach, we then sum up the stage cost along the prediction horizon and substitute the system dynamics into this stage cost in order to obtain an optimal control problem, which is only subject to input constraints. This is then solved cooperatively and distributively um, by, a, by a tool presented in the literature earlier, um, which is special made up for distributed MPC, where a distributed non-convex optimizer is used to solve this non-convex optimization problem. So this was just a brief insight. Um, I also uh, brought a poster with me. We can further discuss this uh, topic there since it's yeah, not trivial, trivial to solve a non-convex optimization problem in a distributed fashion. So for the theory, let's move on and have a closer look at some ex uh, experimental results, in particular, especially one scenario I would like to introduce here, which is a parallel parking scenario, which is um, particularly challenging for non-holonomic mobile robots, so, since what we want to do is we want to parallel park the formation in a uh, direction, so the y direction of the reference frame, which is hardly controllable. What we obtain here, or what we see, is a comparison of a standard quadratic cost approach and a non-quadratic cost function. So as you can see here, for the quadratic cost approach, we obtain a, a significant remaining deviation, which follows from the shape of the level sets, since we cannot further um, drive or reverse the robots, since this would increase the cost too much. However, our proposed cost function continuously seeks to minimize the deviation uh, to the desired set point, and this remaining deviation for the quadratic cost can also see, uh, be seen in the lower right picture. So far, the differential drive forward, let's move on to my last point. Um, why have we called our work non-holonomic mobile robots and not differential drive robots? So the main point is that there is a tool which was proposed last year, the so-called homogeneous approximations, um, which can be used to show also stability or nominal closed loop stability of other more involved non-holonomic mobile robots. Such robots can, for example, be a kinematic car, as you can see here, or um, kinematically the same, 
a differential drive robot with a attached trailer. What we can do there is derive a cost function based on this homogeneous approximation. And as you can see here, this cost function is yeah, highly non-quadratic and really tailored for the non-holonomic constraint we have here. What I want to mention here as well, and it's quite important from a mechanical point of view, is that there is a correlation between the exponent here given in the cost and the order of the input direction. So the order of the input direction means whether we have a direct input field or input fields following from different Lie brackets. So this stage cost is now capable of stabilizing the origin. However, we want to drive also the kinematic car to any set point, and that's why we use our tool of the coordinate transformation and substitute this transformation in the stage cost. And since we are, oh, here you can see another simulation result, and once more you can see here the, yeah, the, the idea behind the elongated level sets. Since we can move further without increasing too much, uh, we can reverse the robot in order to drive to the set point without any remaining deviation. So that's the idea behind controlling non-holonomic mobile robots um, using unconstrained MPC. We can then combine this um, idea with our kinematic output description, with, which bears in mind the non-holonomic constraints and our distributed non-convex optimizer in order to control any non-holonomic formation, also heterogeneous formations consisting of different type of robots. So let me briefly conclude our work. We have first generalized theoretical results in order to drive to any set point in the plane. Then we introduced a kinematic output description as you have also seen before for the omnidirectional robots, but here taking into, into account the non-holonomic constraints. Then we obtained a tailored optimal control problem based on non quadratic cost functions and applied nonlinear TMPC. And we have shown the capability of our algorithm in some hardware experiments. Further, we formalized our findings on the last slide in order to control any kind of uh, non holonomic mobile robot. What's next on, uh, on our agenda? So first and foremost, we want to also conduct some hardware experiments for these other kind of non holonomic mobile robots. And second, um, it stands to reason to apply this obtained distributed controller to real life scenarios such as the transportation task uh, you have also seen before, but this time with differentially driven mobile robots. So thank you very much for your attention. I'm glad to answer uh, any questions you have now or also during the next two days and the poster session tomorrow. Thank you very much. Questions? Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, you showed us that you can control the kinematics of the robotic teams, but can you also control the forces that they collectively exert? So uh, theoretically, we also um, have shown stability for second order models, which in particular use, for example, forces and torques as an input of the system. Um, from a practical point of view, it's easier to control the, um, the velocities as inputs uh, due to the electric motor it's harder to really control or to, to measure forces and torques at a real world robot. So in theory, we can do that as well, but in my opinion um, in the lab, it's harder to control um, forces and torques. But we, actually we are working, uh, as Henrik said before already, um, we are working on force control. So this is maybe also on our agenda for future work. Other questions? So actually, at the, at the, in the last slide, yeah. you sh you showed that uh, you can extend uh, your contribution to like car-like robots. Uh, at, I mean, I think you mentioned also general non-holonomic constraints. So how general can these constraints be? So I mean, can you control I don't know a car with a trailer or this kind of things? Yeah. So that's that's a really really interesting point uh, for future work. Indeed, so if we consider a differential drive robot with one trailer, it's kinematically equivalent to a kinematic car. So mm -hmm. that's the same. And um, what's even more interesting is if we consider like multiple attached mm -hmm. trailers. And that's a really good point. And that's also um, an idea of, or it's hard to say how controllable this topic still is. So what we obtain is that the level sets are getting more elongated. And also we have a more, uh, highly stage cost so it's also hard to solve this optimization problem numerically 
but that's also on the scope for future work. And, but we are quite optimistic that this can be done as well. We also, or at least I think that there's also a formal correlation, as I said, between the order of the magnitude of the exponent and the order of the input field following from leap brackets. Okay, thank you. Okay, I think uh, we can thank the speaker one more time. I invite the third speaker will be uh, Nir Greschler, who will present uh, a work entitled Cooperative Multi-Agent Pathfinding Beyond Path Planning and Collision Avoidance. Okay, hi. So, <clears throat> first of all, it's a real pleasure being here in person. Um, my name is Nir Greschler. I will present our work on Cooperative Multi-Agent Pathfinding Beyond Path Planning and Collision Avoidance. This is a joint work with the Ophir Gordon, Oren Zaltzman, and the Nahum Shimkin. So the multi-agent pathfinding problem, or MAPF in short, deals with a set of a, a mobile agents or robots that move in a shared space. And our task is to find collision-free passes for each robot from its start location to a given a goal location. And this problem is known to be NP-hard, and it has uh, many real life applications such as uh, video games, aircraft towing problems, um, office robots, and the uh, warehouse automation. And I specifically focus on the warehouse automation domain that serves as our uh, motivation problem. In this problem, uh, storage locations in the warehouse host inventory pods that hold the, the goods of different kinds. And then we have a uh, several uh, robots that operate autonomously in the warehouse, carrying up the inventory pods and uh, moving them around the warehouse to a designated drop-off location, where the item uh, is manually taken off the, the shelf or the pod for packaging. So in this problem, we have a set of uh, uh, autonomous uh, robots, all of them of the same uh, type, and each one has to carry out a single delivery task. However, in real life, um, uh, robots or agents are often heterogeneous. That is, they may have different sets of abilities or restrictions such that uh, we may have some tasks that cannot be completed by a single robot, but we need the, the robot to collaborate in order to solve the task. So we term this a truly cooperative setting and we present uh, the cooperative multi-agent pathfinding framework or COMAP if in short. Uh, and in this framework, the agents need to coordinate high level decisions and plans while still uh, avoiding collisions uh, with each other. So consider as a motivation problem, the same warehouse scenario we mentioned earlier, but now we have two types of specialized robots. The first one has a robotic arm that can, that can pick up a certain box or an item from the shelf. The second one is a simple robot that can move around the warehouse and transport uh, the box. And then to complete the delivery, the, the two robots must meet somewhere in the warehouse and transfer the box. And finally, it will be delivered to its designated uh, drop-off location where it will be taken off uh, manually. So this improved scenario uh, offers better flexibility and it may significantly improve the, wa the warehouse performance in terms of a uh, throughput or latency. However, it also presents a significant challenge because not only do we need to find a uh, collision free passes for all agents, but we need uh, uh, to determine the optimal uh, meeting locations between agents such that a uh, delivery time are minimized. And this, uh, this introduces a very challenging uh, 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 task. Okay. So we formulate the problem based on the MAPF uh, formulation or classical MAPF formulation in which the graph, the environment is represented as a graph where vertices uh, uh, correspond to locations in the environment and edges correspond to possible moves between uh, locations. We have a set of K uh, homogeneous agents, A1 to AK, each one uh, with a unique start location. And each agent uh, is given a goal location that it needs to arrive. Um, time is discretized. And in each time step, every robot can either uh, move to an adjacent location or wait at its current location. 
And we define two types of conflicts or collisions between agents. The first one, a vertex conflict, is when two agents try to occupy the same location or the same uh, graph node um, at the same time step. And an edge, locate, an edge conflict is when two uh, agents try to swap their locations in the same uh, time step. So therefore, a valid solution to this problem is a set of uh, conflict-free uh, passes, one pass for each uh, agent from its start location to its goal location. And to measure the quality of a solution, we define uh, the sum of costs objective which is essentially the sum uh, of time step it takes all agents to arrive at their goal. So the, the core map uh, formulation, our problem uh, differs in several uh, aspects. First of all, we may have several sets of agents of different types. And in this work, we specifically focus on, on two types of agents. The first one depicted uh, in red is the initiator agent denoted with alpha. And the second one in blue is the executor agent denoted uh, with beta. And again, each uh, agent uh, is given a start location. However, in COMAPF, uh, agents are not, given, are not given explicit goal location, but instead we have a set of cooperative tasks such that each task denoted tau i has a start location si uh, depicted by the uh, green box in this uh, figure and a goal location for the task GI depicted by the green flag. And each uh, task tower is assigned to a pair of agents, one of each type, uh, namely alpha I and beta I. Then for two agents to complete their task, they must meet somewhere uh, in the environment. That is, they have to set a meeting location and time, and then plan their passes accordingly. And uh, to demonstrate this, oh, sorry, once they set a meeting, um, they, they need to complete the task in the following way. First, the initiator agents move so from its start location to the task start location, and from there to the meeting location at the meeting time. While the executor agent uh, moves from its start location to the uh, meeting location at the meeting time, and from there to the uh, task goal location to complete the task. And to demonstrate this, I will go back to the uh, motivation problem. So here we have two types of robot in blue and red. And the, their task is to deliver the green box. You see my, uh, the green box here. And to deliver it to the green uh, P square. And their uh, uh, meeting location is set in the, in the purple square. And we can see a visualization. So we see the boss uh, robots move, the red robot arrives at the task start location and picks up uh, the box. The blue robot arrives at the meeting location and is going to wait there until the meeting time. Then when the red robot arrives to the meeting, it transfers the box to the blue robot and finishes its part. While the blue robot uh, now delivers the box to the designated uh, drop of location. Okay. So now that we define a solution to the COMAPF problem in a similar uh, manner to the classical MAPF, but now we have a, a set of pass pairs such that each pair of passes completes a single task by a, a two robots. And we also similarly define the sum of cost objective, which is the uh, sum of time steps it takes all, all tasks to be completed. So in classical MAPF, we wish to find a collision free passes for all agents from a start location to a goal location. So we therefore search in the space of all possible uh, conflicts of pa or passes. However, in our problem in COMAPF, um, we also need to find a uh, meeting locations uh, as well as dealing with collision, with collisions between agents. So therefore we need to search the space of all possible meeting locations and times. We, we term this uh, the meeting space and it is uh, exponentially large. And therefore we cannot use a straightforward search algorithm, but we, we need to perform the search in a, a systematic and efficient manner. Um, uh, uh, okay, and, one, and, and during the search, while, when we consider a specific meeting, we need to plan collision-free passes uh, in the way I showed before. 
So we present the cooperative conflict-based search algorithm or CoCBS in short uh, that implements uh, these ideas. It is based on a well-known uh, algorithm uh, called CBS, conflict-based search that solves the map of problem uh, uh, optimally. And it adds another level of search in the meeting space by efficiently generating sets of meetings, one meeting for each task uh, in a non-decreasing manner. And, and to uh, avoid the exponential blow up in the meeting space, we decouple the search for a meeting for, uh, from conflict resolution and past planning. Uh, COSIBS is our algorithm is both complete and optimal. And you can find full details in our paper. And I also bought a poster uh, that I will present tomorrow. And that concludes my talk. And I will be happy uh, to answer any questions. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so the idea behind MapAF is when you have collision, basically is a node-node and edge-node collision, but one of the, you know, the manipulator, when it moves, it goes beyond, the, uh, beyond one node that is the square. So it means that the kind of traditional way of you doing MapAF probably doesn't work. And perhaps in the example, was it obvious because there was just only two robots? I'm wondering whether you have you extended the definition of collision when you have manipulator robot when it moves it basically occupy a spa uh, space more than one grid okay so we in this problem we dealt with uh, with this problem in high level we, we didn't deal with a a, manipul a specific manipulator robot that can occupy more than a, 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 a one grid square in general, you can think that uh, the, both of these robots have different velocities as well. I mean, you can generalize this uh, to, uh, uh, to more uh, real life uh, uh, generalization, but this only shows the high level uh, 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 computational complexity of the problem and we so show how to solve it, uh, but we don't deal with the uh, low level details of uh, the execution of the plans, but this can be uh, done as well. Other questions? So maybe following up with the previous question, uh, do you think uh, uh, or, or have you thought about uh, including uh, like uh, non-controlled elements in the in the in the scene? I mean, if you if the, in the, your warehouse you have human operators or uh, these kind of things that can sort of disrupt your planning. Uh, so. We don't deal with that as well in this problem. I mean, it's a, I, I think it's a slightly different uh, research area, the, the interaction between uh, human mm -hmm. and robots. Um, but we do deal with uh, um, robots of different types. And this also can be generalized to, again, to different with different capabilities and, uh, and restrictions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other question? Okay, if not, let's thank the speaker one more time. Okay, so the next speaker will be Maximilian Kromuller, who will present a paper entitled On Demand Grocery Delivery from Multiple Local Stores with Autonomous Robots. Hi, can you hear me? <laughs> okay, I think you can hear me. Is that true? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, perfect. Then let's hop right into it. Thanks for the kind introduction. Um, so our topic is called on-demand grocery delivery from multiple local stores with autonomous robots. And to motivate the problem, in the in recent years we've seen two um, yeah trends that combined bear huge potential. And that's number one is flash deliveries, or in other words that customers desire very fast deliveries. And what's a flash delivery? Um, that's a delivery within, for example, 10 minutes. So you could order now and have your goods before the end of my talk. And we see that manifested in many things like 
um, the pop-up of firms that do offer such services like GTO Gorillas, Flingo, GoPub, there are many more. And on the other side, we see automated delivery robots becoming more popular. They are developed by various firms, they are tested and deployed. And those things together, we think they ask for planning and routing algorithms in charge for computing robots routes to operate such operations. So we saw, saw the previous talk that every robot had one task. And now let's say there are multiples. And so we have the question, which robot does what? And that's what this research question is about. Um, I want to introduce the problem a bit more formally. And therefore, we have different aspects of it. And the first one is a depot. A depot is, an, is a location where we can go to and get goods from, um, for example, a supermarket. Then we have a fleet of delivery robots. Um, those are the ancients transporting goods around. And you will also hear me talk about vehicles. Um, those two terms can be used quite, quite similar here. Um, then we have a lot of orders. So those are customers asking for a specific set of goods, which they want to have at a given location. Um, we have evolving time. So our problem is a dynamic, it's on demand. So it's changing constantly. Time is flowing, the state of the problem is changing and yeah, that's evolving time. Having time, there will also be future orders. So things to do um, we don't know of yet. And the goal or the objective is to find a route for each robot to deliver some orders. Um, they need to be picked up first and then they can be delivered. And those routes, those need to be constantly updated because time will change the problem at hand. And this is the same day delivery problem. And we changed that problem to make it even harder. And we introduced multiple depots. Um, so now in the whole service area, there are multiple depots where goods can be picked up. And that introduces the question, which of them should be used. And third, we allow all robots to change their routes on the fly um, to adapt to new situations. Next, I want to show you the proposed algorithm to handle such problems. And what you see here is an overview. And at the top, you see solver and then the evolving time symbol, uh, meaning we solve one problem, um, one state of the problem, then propagate time forward, and then we solve the next one. And how we solve a single state um, is depicted here at the bottom, and we do that in stages. And the first um, step is we find potential pickup locations for each order. A second step is we calculate trips, um, a set of trips for each robot. In a thir third step, we then think about which of those trips we calculated previously should be executed by which robot. And then in, a, in the last step, we propagate time forward and update the problem accordingly. In the following slides, I want to show you with you each of those steps in a bit more detail. And so let's start with the first one, potential pickup locations. And therefore, we define a term called candidate. And a candidate is a combination of a potential pickup location with an order. So imagine the situation on the right, then that would be a candidate. So an order and a pickup location. And we introduce here a heuristic um, that says we consider x depots for each order. And if x equals 1, that would be only one, uh, the closest one. And if it would be all depots in the area, we would consider them all. And here's an example for x equals three. So we consider three depots which are closest to the order's destination. In the second step, we come up with trips. And a trip is a sequence of locations belonging to a set of candidates, um, a, a vehicle or robot visits um, in order. And it's feasible if none of the constraints of each candidate is violated. So let, let's again do an example. Here is the situation, and then this would be a trip. So robot delivers an order having on board, goes to a depot, gets new stuff, and delivers further orders. But there are many options, right? And all of these lines you see here are potential trips. And we do so for each robot. And then we come to step three, which asks which of those trips we calculated previously should be executed. And therefore, we now look at all robots together. And to find this solution, we solve an integer linear program. And in regard of time, 
I, I'm going to be quick here. So we have an objective function that could be set by the operator like distance or service. And then we have some constraints like each robot can only be used once. And as a result, we get a trip for each robot that should be executed. And this brings me to the next step where we propagate time forward um, to the next decision. And here each vehicle follows the plan that was previously assigned. And if it was assigned none, um, which is possible, then it just gets rebalanced to the next closest depot. We can also see that from an order perspective, and that means each order can have different states. It could be still unknown, it could be placed, but we don't decide to service it yet. It can be picked up by a robot, it could be delivered already, or we can reject it. And reject means an order can't be delivered within its constraints, which is something like there is a latest delivery time and you need to deliver in advance. And if you don't manage, you have to reject it. This brings me to how did we validate our method or how did we analyze it? And we simulated a day of service in a city. Uh, in this case, it's Amsterdam. Amsterdam is represented as a graph uh, seen here on the left. And we had 30 robots, 10,000 orders over 13 hours. We had 20 different depots in Amsterdam and we had a maximum delay for each order of 24 minutes. So if you order it latest in 24 minutes, you will have your goods. And here are some results. Um, you see the service rate, um, delivery time and total driven distance by all robots. So those were metrics we analyzed our results by. And service rate is quite straightforward. The more you deliver, the higher the service rate. Um, and here you see two different bars. The purple one is the baseline. I just introduced in a previous step. And the yellow bar is a changed up scenario where in this case, we only look at a single depot um, in the city center. And we wanted to see what's the effect. And we saw that the service rate drops about 20%. Delivery time nearly doubles. And despite delivering less, we see a strong increase in total delivered uh, distance. So there is a value and um, th those results put some numbers on it, how good it is to have multiple depots. And next, I want to talk about the heuristic I introduced earlier, right? There is the question, is it valid? Um, is it not? And what you see here, the different bars are numbers of depots considered per order. So in purple, it, it's one. So I only consider the closest ones. And then we increase that to three, five, seven. And what we see um, in results is that the service rate rises um, up to five depots per order and then drops for seven. Delivery time is fairly constant. And the same be behavior as for the service rate we see for the total driven distance. So we see decreasing and then increasing again. And what we concluded here is considering only one depot can be inferior to considering multiple ones. So sometimes it's best to not use the closest one. And then to consider as many depots as possible can be inefficient for dynamic problems having imperfect anticipation. So if you don't know the future perfectly, you maybe take a bad decision if you consider too many depots. And this brings me to some videos showing our approach in action. So you see here the cars moving around. You see here we have many depots because it's a real case study for supermarkets within Amsterdam. And here is a second example where we look at one car in detail and you see the green path. That's the plan of the vehicle. Um, it should start soon. And then on the right side, there will be a new order coming up. So the situation changes and the car just adapted its plan, having this new information and incorporating this new order that came up. And with that, I want to conclude. And my, the main takeaways here are the proposed method can, can handle multiple depots in dynamic problems, which um, hasn't been done before. We also consider that using multiple, multiple depots is beneficial. How many um, was beyond the scope. And we also see that the introduced heuristic worked um, fairly well and that the route adaptions improved results. There was no slide, but we also found that beneficial. I just skipped that for time reasons. And last, the proposed method scales to large problem sizes like 10,000 orders in our examples, which is, which is fairly good.
Thanks a lot for your attention. And I think now we have time for some questions. Thanks. Thank you very much. Questions? No, here they are. No. Hi, thanks. Um, in, in your formulation, you can only ever, it's, total, it's completely on demand. So you can only ever request now and be delivered in some time constraint. I was wondering, in your opinion, what do you lose by having planned orders in the system? So for example, I want an order at 9 p.m. Yeah, so that's, that's correct. Um, so what would change is that you have something like time windows. So an earliest delivery time, if you introduce a time window, right? So you have the advantage that you have more computational time um, to, on your hand because you have more time to adapt or you know the information third in advance. Um, the problem is also that it sometimes becomes computationally harder because you already have many things. And we know that it's NP hard, right? Um, so most delivery cases are handled exactly that way. You can only order for the next day. And what then happens is overnight, they gather all the information they have, they calculate for, for a full night and then come up with one solution. And that's basically the difference here that we only have a really, really short amount of time to calculate um, our routes. And yeah, that's why we, for now, decided to not include that possibility, basically. But it's a really interesting question how two, two things could come together that you, for example, change a pre-calculated route on the, um, to also integrate on the MAT orders. It's really good, thanks. There's another question here. Uh, hi, and thank you for your work. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, I was wondering if you ever considered the uh, possible failures of the delivery robots and uh, what impact it might have on the delivery time on, and yeah. the process adapts to it. So, um, yeah, we, I thought about it and it often goes to a variant called the stochastic dynamic vehicle routing problem where you have um, for example, delivery times to go from A to B um, is a stochastic time. So you don't know um, when you start at point A, when I, will I arrive at point B? For example, there are more red lights or less red lights, um, and that it reduces some uncertainty. Um, that's very close to, I think, what you asked for. Um, the problem we solved is hard um, as it is. So we first did not include that. Um, we first wanted to solve the problem as it is, but it's an interesting further research question we might tackle. Okay, we have a question from the remote audience. And the question is, is it allowed to preempt a delivery due to cancellation or finding a better delivery? Um, so what we decided is as soon as an order is on board, it will get delivered. Um, so then you can't reject it anymore. Um, previously, you can decide to not, if there are better options, you can decide to reject the order. Okay. Any one quick question? May I ask a quick one? Thank you, Max, for a really good presentation. Um, you've considered the scaling of the number of depots in the graph, but I'm thinking logically that is it not would you not get more performance from the locations of them? And are you considering locations? Where are these depots placed? I'm thinking that you would have one depot in a very busy area, be more beneficial than having five depots at the edge of town. Yeah. And if it was next to each other, that brings you no value. So are you, can you infer optimal? Um, so it's a completely different problem that deals with that question. Where should I place my supermarkets, depots, warehouses? no matter which um, operation do you have. Um, and the way we did it is we implemented a greedy case center algorithm um, that came up with the locations. Um, and then we also ran a, a real case simulation study where we used the actual location of supermarkets, but for sure the location of the depots has an effect. And most of the ways it's handled at the moment 
the depots far outside of the city because it's cheaper to get space there. Um, but that really st stands in contrast with those um, fast deliveries of, for example, 10 minutes. And we see small shops opening up in city centers. And yeah. Did you say KD tree or what, did, what algorithm was it? Um, we implemented a K-Center algorithm, a greedy version of it um, because it wasn't a focus, but in general, uh, feel free to reach out, send me an email, and then we can discuss. I can explain you in detail um, how we did it and how it works. Okay. Thanks a lot. Running out of time, let's uh, thank the speaker one more time. All right, so the next speaker will be Filippo Bertoncelli, who will present a paper entitled Characterization of Graph Configuration for Multi Robot Object Pushing. Uh, thank you for, so much for the presentation. Uh, as well, I'm Filippo Bertoncelli from the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia. And uh, my work here is on uh, canonization of uh, uh, the grasp configurations for multi robot object pushing. First of all, uh, what's the motivation? Uh, generally, in classical manipulation, uh, prehensile manipulation problems, uh, uh, the research has led to different ways to evaluate uh, the quality of, of a configuration with respect to a task. And for example, we can uh, discriminate between two configurations, which one is better than the other to, for, for a simple task. And overall, there has been set um, general properties like force and form closure that uh, can, to a certain extent, guarantee that a configuration is capable of uh, fulfilling a task. Uh, but on the field of non prehensile manipulation, when we um, purposely avoid the presence of uh, uh, force and, for and form closure, uh, how can we discriminate between two configurations? And that's exactly what we are trying to propose now. So the problem here is to find a characterization for uh, non prehensile grasp that uh, expresses the quality of such configuration uh, with respect to a planner task in, in this particular case. And we consider both the efficacy of the configuration, meaning that um, the, if the configuration is capable of carrying out such task, and also the energy efficiency, uh, efficiency which uh, allows us to determine uh, between two configuration, which one is the best. With that said, we proposed two uh, quality metrics. Uh, the first one on the uh, left is ranks the effectiveness of the grasps and is the uh, normalized displacement over the course of the uh, of the contact points uh, on the uh, on the object over the course of the manipulation. And the second metric is the energy efficiency, the normalized energy efficiency, which is uh, the um, sum of the energy uh, that uh, each pushing agent uh, applies to the object uh, normalized by the length of the manipulation. Next, the first component that we introduce is a compatibility test, uh, which aims at uh, checking and testing if uh, give, uh, given a manipulation task, a plan manipulation task, and its associated branches given from the um, sliding motion that the object has to do on, uh, on the floor or on the table on the surface that it's moving on, uh, if the uh, selected configuration is capable to uh, provide the necessary branches on the table. And uh, in short, we check that the um, set of task branches is included in the set of uh, applicable branches by the configuration, considering the, uh, the shape of the object and also the uh, friction coefficient from between the, the pushing agents and the object. Next, uh, we propose four uh, quality indexes that can be calculated uh, offline, so before knowing, knowing uh, some information, of course, on the uh, geometry of the uh, object and the configuration, but it can be calculated online. And three of them are taken from uh, grasping literature, and the fourth of them is uh, the one proposed by us. 
the first one, composed quality index, uh, ranks the angular distribution of uh, the contact points around the object and as well as their capability to reduce uh, inertial uh, effects on the object. Uh, the extension index measures the, the area of the polygon uh, uh, made by the contact points. And it has been proven that uh, the larger this area, the more stable the configuration is, the, the, the grasp is. The uh, third one is the grasp dexterity index, uh, which ranks uh, the isotropy of the grasp. And this index goes to zero if the uh, grass matrix uh, becomes singular, so the graph is, is singular. The fourth one is the one we proposed, is a modified house of distance, and it's a ranking on uh, the distance between the set of applicable forces and uh, the set of uh, task requirement branches that, uh, that the task requires. Uh, the idea behind this one is that the um, uh, closer these two sets are, the easier it is for the pushing agents to apply directly the necessary forces and, uh, um, and have a, a cumulative uh, result that is uh, composed by less singular forces uh, with respect to like, having a, a wider um, set of applicable forces. To assess the uh, quality in our procedure, uh, we generated a set of uh, validation tasks, uh, which in this case is uh, the planar manipulation of the four shapes you can see uh, on the screen over the six trajectories starting from the center that you can see uh, drawn below. Uh, the second step is the generation of a set of Bali configurations, uh, 200, if I remember correctly, uh, for each task, according to our, uh, um, our uh, requirements. So uh, that the configuration has to be uh, non-prehensile. And given the set of configuration, we compute all the indices of uh, associated to that configuration and that in, in the single task. And then we simulated the manipulation with uh, uh, each configuration following the given trajectory. Here, you can see one example of the manipulation. Uh, the object uh, has to follow a sinusoidal shape uh, horizontally. Here you can see a, a successful manipulation where the pushing agent which unfortunately uh, are not really that visible, uh, but can su successfully move the object around the plane according to the predefined tra trajectory. While here, you can see a, a failed manipulation where the configuration was not uh, fit for the assigned task. And so uh, the robot moving without feedback on the, uh, the object position leave the object behind and continue with the with their process, uh, not caring about the object. Collecting on the result, we provide a statistical evaluation on the effectiveness and the um, results of the test. Uh, we performed a weaker concern, rank some test on uh, on these two values on uh, the the first metric, the uh, normalized di uh, displacement, and we obtain a correlation. Uh, with the uh, passing on the, um, or failing on the test with a uh, very good p-value. And as well, uh, we compare the, the, check the correlation between the uh, success of the manipulation and the result of the test. And we obtain that there's a correlation. So indeed, the proposed test uh, can uh, determine beforehand uh, if a configuration is uh, can uh, accomplish a task or not. Next, uh, we check the correlation uh, for our uh, or for proposed indexes. And uh, as you can see, these are the plotted values against the normalized uh, energy 
and five by task as I presented before. And uh, the only uh, metric, and the only index uh, that um, shows a, a significant correlation is the modified house, house of distance with a p-value of 0 0.02. And so we can use this index to, uh, to evaluate between multiple configurations. And that's what we did in our case study. So it you know, optimized the uh, grass configuration for a pushing uh, task. Uh, we proposed this first procedure. Uh, we generate a random set of grasps that have these requirements. So no set collision between the agents. That is non-prehensible, non-prehensible. And the, um, each configuration has to pass the uh, gra um, grass pass test that we proposed. Second, then in a select the configuration with the max uh, modified household difference, distance, sorry. And then we refine conf uh, the configuration using a uh, optimization problem that optimizes on, again on the modified house of distance starting from the selected configuration from the set. Uh, the constraints on the optimization problem are uh, the same uh, that we apply on the generation of the random graphs. So there's no self, there has to be self, uh, no self collision. The configuration, the configuration still has to be non prehensile. And we assume that uh, the, but we assume that the configuration will be close enough to the starting point uh, so that we don't have to check again the uh, test. Here you're going to see a manipulation task uh, with the three pack robots, differential dry robots uh, in our uh, arena. And the robot move. Uh, autonomously and follow a predefined trajectory. So there's no feedback between uh, the position of the object and the position of the robot with respect to the object. And we obtain the, uh, the performance that you see on, uh, on screen, which is quite good considering that it's no feedback and how uh, unstable it is pushing as in general. So uh, for the work, of course, going to be about uh, improving this, uh, th this methodology and possibly applying it uh, to different scenarios. Thank you so much. Any questions? Yes, Roderick. Thanks for the talk. How much effort is needed to calibrate these robots because you want them to move at the same speed and uh, and move all forward if you program them to move forward? Because if I understand correctly, they were moving along an open loop trajectory. Is that correct? They uh, no, they they were assigned a trajectory given from the task, considering the uh, the configuration on the uh, on the object. Uh, but the, the trajectory was generated beforehand. So uh, they all moved uh, uh, receiving like uh, the same uh, time-wise uh, reference point on, on the trajectory, each one its own. But th there's feedback on the control of the robots, if that's what you ask. Any other question? Uh, thank you for the very interesting talk. Um, there was the wording, maybe maybe it's a wording that, that's well known and that just, I don't know, but you mentioned the CRAS task compatibility test. What kind of test is that? Is that purely kinematic or is there something about the force with the with the uh, inertia values of the object or what's behind that? Uh, okay, maybe it wasn't clear enough. The, the, the test is a, uh, is a procedure we proposed. Okay. And uh, we extract the required branches from a, a manipulation task that is defined as a plan and the following of a planet trajectory on of the on a plane from the object uh, using the limit surface uh, the, from the fictional limit surface we extract the branches that are required to um, perform this task and. Uh, uh, we compare that set of branches with the set of applicable branches from the configuration. So we consider each 
contact point and its friction cone, we combine them together and generate a set of applicable uh, forces on the robot uh, and we compare the two sets. So oh, wow. the, set, the, the forces from the uh, robots has to balance the force, the, the wrenches from, uh, from the task. Ah, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I think we are running out of time. So let's thank the speaker one more time. Okay, so the next speaker is uh, uh, presenting uh, remotely. And uh, I guess the speaker will be Mohsen Rofi, who will present a paper entitled Speed versus Accuracy Trade-off in Collective Estimation, an Adaptive Exploration Exploitation Case. Yes. Um, hi, uh, can you hear me? If you can give me a feedback, that would be nice. Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. Super. So, um, hello again, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Mohsen, and I'm very delightful to virtually be there. Actually, you are hearing me from Berlin. Um, in a minute, I'm going to talk about our paper. Um, but before that, I guess it's worthy to introduce our group to you. So we are members of a cluster called uh, Science of Intelligence, uh, where we try to mostly ask and sometimes answer questions about intelligence on individual, social, and collective levels. Um, in our team, I mean the author team, uh, Pavel is the lead PI, is a site, uh, is a um, physicist. Um, Heiko Hamann um, co-supervises the project, and he's a swarm roboticist. And um, I am a control engineer slash newbie computer scientist, um, recently started my um, second year of PhD. So um, I will start with a little bit of introduction on collective estimation. So we picked collective estimation as one manifestation of um, collective decision making. Um, but the whole idea behind it is based on the fact that um, the average of many imperfect um, estimation can be close to the true value, the, the so-called wisdom of crowds effect that dates back to, I don't know, decades ago, the very famous story of estimating the um, cow's weight. And um, there are still other research um, uh, investigating on this uh, phenomenon. Um, so uh, researchers um, were studying the right conditions under which um, the collective arrives at um, wise uh, decision or estimation. And one of them is diversity of opinion. So by diversity, uh, specifically here, we talk about variation of opinions within the collective. So we will mostly focus on diversity. And um, for that, we, we introduce two mechanisms. Uh, one of them is exploration. And we know that exploration or explorative agents increase or promote diversity um, within groups. On the other hand, if you want to make a collective decision, um, then you need some sort of social interaction uh, to happen between agent that promotes consensus, but on the other hand, reduces diversity. So if we see diversity change as a feature in the collective, we have exploration and social interaction as two opposing forces. But please also note the color code of red and blue here. So probably in the course of um, presentation, I will use exploitation as like interchangeably to social interaction. Uh, so yeah, we are going to talk about accuracy a lot, um, but it is it is good to make a clear definition of what accuracy means because we found it a little bit overlooked in the context of collective decision making. So you are probably familiar with bias variance decomposition of total error. But in the context of collective decision making, if we uh, show each individual's opinion by these cross signs, trying to hit the target, the center of these bullseye, um, we can say that um, we have bias in collective estimation, which is the distance of the centroid of collective estimation to the true value. And um, we have also variance or precision error. So in order for a collective estimation to be totally accurate, it has to be uh, bias-free 
and precise. So please keep this to these two or three definitions in mind uh, for the rest of the presentation. Um, yeah, so we use a very simple linear um, consensus model that is like again very old, but uh, it it shows how agents uh, agent I at time t updates its opinion z as the weighted average of its previous opinion and its local uh, social information that it gathers from its neighbors. So it is basically nothing but the diffusion of information through through the network. So if in this case we have a ring topology and these red lines are the opinions um, over time, under some conditions, um, the collective or the group can arrive at consensus. So if the network is a static, we have a spectral analysis and we can talk about um, the condition, um, like the, the network to be strongly connected or not and um, things like that. But when agents start to move around in the environment, things get too complicated to do, the, do such analysis. Um, so yes, um, let me talk about the scenario that uh, we are going to uh, address. Uh, let's assume that there is a evidence or a feature in the environment that is distributed. So you can see in this case, it's a radial convex or cone shape in 3D, if you will, um, that we show it by the grayness uh, of each pixel. And we have agents distributed in a biased initial uh, position in the space. So in order to get a diverse enough opinion, they have to explore the environment. And um, by doing that, they increase diversity, increase trueness, but decrease precision. So precision, trueness, and yeah. Uh, but at some point in time, they switch to exploitation. And by exploitation, I mean social interaction, which um, results in higher precision in their opinion. And also they have a tendency to that we call this homophily and we show it by like collective motion in the space uh, and for that we define the tendency of agents to get closer to those other agents with um, similar opinion or like-minded agents if you want um, so everything here is distributed they don't have any a priori information about the environment the only thing that in this case we have is the switching time so nothing else. And um, we use very simple rules um, on the individual level, but on the collective level, we will see these complex behavior that uh, probably I will show later how, how it is complex. Um, yes, so let's get back to speed accuracy trade-offs. Um, so the interesting thing is that at each phases during the exploration, we see speed accuracy trade-off but specifically the trueness um, speed trade-off, if you want. So over time, trueness error that is shown by the blue line, blue solid line, um, decreases. Um, and um, in the exploitation phase, um, the precision error um, is decreasing. So this is um, somehow the point that we wanted to say. So, the collective start from a biased uh, distribution and by doing exploration, they increased variance or um, increased precision error, but these increased uh, variance help them to decrease trueness error. Sorry for the um, confusing terms. I hope you get what I'm saying. Um, but in order to get to the left side of the area, they need to do exploitation and to social interact with each other to, to gain the information that is there in the collective. But there is another speed accuracy trade-off in another level if we change the switching time. So if we switch earlier to exploitation, what happens? Or if we do it later? So if we have plenty of time for the whole scenario, um, the later you switch to exploitation is better. But things get more interesting when you have lower time budget. Then it means that um, because the con arriving at consensus is a time consuming process, you, the collective needs to save some portion of time for the 
um, for the end of this scenario. So if you switch early, you lost the, the, the part of the scenario that makes your estimation to be bias-free. If you switch too late, then you don't have enough time to um, arrive at consensus. So that was um, the point here. I guess I have to be quick. So this is the video uh, abstract that we submitted. Please watch it. I don't have um, enough time to go to the details. We also introduce an adaptive mechanism for the switching that then the agents don't need any prior information for the um, switching time. But if you are interested in other environmental distributions, uh, multimodal or nonlinear, linear, and um, uh, more complicated environments, then uh, we showed that um, the method is able to capture the isocontours of such um, more complex environments. And these are the um, Q or um, yeah, environmental distributions. Uh, last but not least, if I have just a minute, I would say that um, as the outlook, we also tried the extreme regimes of, of physical constraint for communication range. And we showed that if we have, if the, if the network is limited in the connectivity, then we will see that echo chambers emerge. And by echo chambers, we say agents whose opinion or estimation are close together, get together and shape clusters that are disconnected from the others. And um, later, we proposed a solution um, that we call them messenger type or messenger state for agents. And these messengers that are shown by these tiny red circle around them, they just move around and they try to um, share their opinion to the other groups. So by, by doing that, the collective is able to achieve consensus again and the information will flow uh, throughout the whole collective. Uh, I guess um, I should wrap up my um, uh, presentation here by saying thank you for your attention and um, we are quite open for discussion and um, hearing your feedback. But I cannot hear you, I guess. Yeah. Hi, thank you for thank you for that yeah. talk. Really cool. Yeah, no, thank you. I have a question about the, the, the last thing you showed about the, the messengers. Um, yes. Please. You, when you're doing this, have you thought about messengers having different strengths of uh, persuasion, let's say? So like if one if one group is the best, and I'm I'm just thinking of humans in real life where you have one group thinks they're the best and if you send a messenger from that group to somewhere else. Um, I mean, do all the messengers have similar strengths or very? Ah, uh, but your voice was broken a little bit, but um, I guess you you said that um, how they how they know if they want to send a messenger, right? Is that the question? Can you? Sorry, uh, I'll speak a bit louder. Thanks. All the messengers are they exactly the same in terms of how? Yes. Yes, uh, ever, yeah, um, all are same, and we are using a homogeneous um, collective, and these changing to the new state of Messenger is a Markov process, so they just, out of blue, they just decide to be a Messenger. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's no difference who, who is Messenger or who is not. But there are, of course, other more intelligent ways of sending a Messenger, so if your group is too tiny, you don't need to send a messenger, then you will lose your, your group. But um, yeah, I guess I, I don't know if I answered your question or not. But Thank you. Yeah.